The Bible, uh, for me, is a guidebook. I think it's inspired by God, and I do think it's filled with inaccuracies. And you'll see things in there that remind you of yourself, and it'll make you really want to change. You realize that that Bible's not lying to you, but it's telling you truth. It's just a, a storybook written by some people about some character. There's plenty of things that even if you don't believe in God, there's plenty of things in the Bible that can improve your life. I personally don't think everything should be taken literally. The Bible? Mm, that's controversial. <laughs> Thank you for asking. The Bible is still here. It, this book is almost 2,000 years old. It, it still exists for some reason, and to me, that stands out. That means something. That it's not coincidence. Well, some 20 years ago now, I heard a Brazilian pastor and evangelist named Nilson Fanini uh, speak at a conference I was at, and he told a story that I still remember to this day. He said that years prior to that, he had been leading a mission team from his church in Brazil in um, rural Africa. I think it was an agricultural project um, that also included a uh, presentation of the gospel and so forth. Uh, and his team, as they traveled, uh, for some reason were able to take uh, a crate of a thousand Bibles in the dialect of the people who lived in that region of Africa um, that they were hoping to distribute uh, after they did the agricultural project with farmers. So they traveled all the way there and when they finally got to this tiny village, uh, it was very late at night, they only had time to, um, to uh, go to bed. And in the morning, very early, uh, before it was light, still dark outside, one of uh, Pastor Fanini's colleagues woke him up and said, Pastor, Pastor, you have to come see this. Took them outside and they looked out into the darkness and there was a line of people standing on the village road stretching uh, over a mile. Uh, and there were people evidently waiting for their Bibles. Word had leaked out through the night that they had Bibles and people had walked from large distances all through the night and were standing waiting in line to get their personal copy of the Bible. So we have to ask why. Why would people like that walk all night, stand in the mile long line just to get their own copy of an ancient book. Why is the Bible the most printed, the most read, and the best-selling book in the history of the world? After all, the Bible is kind of a complicated and intimidating book. This is a Pew Bible printed in 1868. Someone gave me years ago. It'd be a little hard to carry to church. <laughs> but, but the Bible is, is a large sort of intimidating book. It's a collection of 66 different books written by over 40 authors in three languages over about 1,600 years. It includes history and poetry and prophecy and genealogies and prayers and songs and personal letters and love stories and parables and preaching and apocalyptic visions. It can be very hard to understand, and yet it remains so popular because it claims to tell two stories. It claims to tell the story of God, and it claims to tell our story, your story and my story. We're in a week six of a series we're calling Explore God, and today we take on the question, is the Bible reliable. I was reminded this week of a story that's told of a little girl who came out of her Sunday school class one Sunday, and she bumped into her pastor who was walking through the hallway. And the pastor asked her, uh, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And the little girl says, we learned the story of Jonah and the big fish. And the pastor decided to tease the little girl a little bit, so he said, uh, do you really believe a grown man could be swallowed by a fish? And she said, yes, I do, because our teacher said, it's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's true. And the pastor said, well, what if your teacher is wrong? The little girl thought for a minute and said, well, then I'll ask Jonah when I get to heaven. <laughs> and then the pastor said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And without skipping the beat, she said, well, then you can ask him, she said. <laughs> the question today is, how can we know? Why should we trust that the Bible is reliable? And there are really three options when it comes to thinking about the Bible. Uh, the first is I call uncritical belief. That is, someone who says, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, without really asking any of the hard questions about the Bible. The second position would be what I would call uncritical unbelief or skepticism. Someone who says, like someone did in that video, I can't believe the Bible because it's filled with myths and inaccuracies. 
Science tells me miracles are impossible, therefore the Bible is just a fairy tale. Without ever taking, uh, making the effort to actually read what's in it or to research its claims. Uncritical unbelief. And there's the third position, the one we're going to try to take today, which is thoughtful evaluation of the available evidence. Thoughtful evaluation of the available evidence. If I offered you an investment opportunity, let's say I claimed I could turn $100 into $100,000 in a month. You would be foolish to give me your $100 without doing a little research about my claims, right? On the other hand, you might also be a little bit foolish to disregard my claim out of hand without doing a little research. Because what if it were true? What if my claim was reliable? Well, that's what we're going to try to do today. I want to start with two very uh, short texts out of the Gospels. And then we'll talk about three things from there. We're going to talk about uh, literary evidence. We're going to talk about collateral evidence. And we're going to talk about experiential evidence for the reliability of God's Word. Luke chapter 1, this is the way Luke begins his gospel. He writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That's the beginning of Luke's gospel. Then at the very end of John's gospel, he writes this. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. So the first thing I want to talk about today is documentary evidence. Let me do a little quiz first. I want to find out how much you know about our first president. Okay? These are a series of true-false statements about George Washington. You ready? Just, just holler out true or false. Okay, true or false. George Washington's middle name was Charles. True? Anybody? False? Trick question. George Washington didn't have a middle name. <laughs> All right, true or false. George Washington wore a wig for that famous portrait. True? False? Oh, gotcha. George Washington never wore a wig. That's his hair. <laughs> I never knew that. I wonder how many times he had to have it, have it done. Because it always looks perfect. Okay, True or false, he had lifelong dental problems. True, True. okay. Um, the truth is, uh, at the time of his first inauguration, when I think he was 57 years old, he only had one natural tooth left at age 57. Bonus question, true or false, his false teeth were made of wood. Oh, my dad made the same mistake. That's actually a legend, not true. His false teeth were actually carved from ivory, and he bought them from his African-American slaves. He bought human teeth from his slaves to make his dentures. Okay, question number four, true or false, George Washington had no biological children. True, okay. He did, however, have two stepdaughters. Now, how do we know these things? None of us have ever met or seen George Washington. He died in 1799, I think, over 220 years ago. So how can we know anything with certainty about his life? Well, I could read a biography of Washington. I have one here. I've not actually read it yet. It's 900 pages long. That's probably why I haven't read it. But I could read this biography, and I will someday. But even then, how, if I've read every page, how would I know that the author is credible? How would I know? Some of, you, some of you know this, but the credibility of any document is established by asking at least four questions. First, how great is the gap between when the event happened or the person lived and when it was written down? In this case, 220 years or so. This biography of George Washington, that's, that's the gap. Second question is, how early are the earliest available copies. Was it written immediately upon the event or was it written centuries later? The gap, makes sense, right? How many copies were there originally? The more copies, the greater the reliability. And then what's the variance between copies? Do they all say exactly the same thing or they tell wildly different accounts of the same event? So how does the Bible compare to other famous texts from history? A Couple of examples. For example, the collected works of Aristotle. 
I'm sure you were poring over this recently, your personal reading. Written originally in about 340 B.C. The earliest copies we have date to 1140 A.D. So that's a gap of almost 1,500 years from when he originally, when Aristotle lived and when the first copies we have of his writings. And there are only five available copies of that earliest set of copies. So with regard to historical reliability, not so much Aristotle. However, widely trusted and taught in universities in America today. Secondly, consider the Iliad by Homer. I think I was supposed to read this in college. <laughs> Written in 900 B.C., earliest copies we have are dated to 400 B.C., a gap of 500 years. And there are 643 copies of Homer's Iliad from 400 B.C. So somewhat more reliable than Aristotle and still taught as trustworthy in universities in America today. What about the New Testament? New Testament was written between 40 and 100 A.D. The earliest manuscripts date to about 60 A.D., which is just 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. A little perspective here. I've been at this church for 32 years now. So you could research my early sermons and find tapes and manuscripts somewhere of 30 years ago. Some of you have heard, and you could bear witness to those things. They would be not hard to find. 30 years is not a very long time. That's the first manuscripts we have of the gospel according to Mark. So virtually no gap between the events and when they were first written down. And how many copies do you think there are? How many early manuscripts? 24,000 from that period of time. And yet the New Testament is regarded by many in our culture as mythological and untrustworthy. Now next we could look at the question of variance. I mean, how much variance is there between the early copies and the late copies? For example, if you take Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote his plays about 200 years ago. And literary scholars today believe that there's about a 5% variance. 5% of his, everything he wrote is up for grabs. We're not sure if he really wrote that or not. That's over 200 years. Now why would that be true? Well, copying documents uh, has not always been easy, as easy as it is today. In the world where there was no computers and no photocopiers, uh, they had to be copied by hand over and over again hundreds of times. So it's not uncommon for scholars to find copying errors. For example, misspellings or words that are repeated, words that are accidentally omitted. There's a famous Bible that was published in 1631. One word was missing from just one of the commandments. The word was not the commandment was, thou shalt not commit adultery, which means it read, thou shalt. And it's called the Adulterer's Bible for obvious reasons. So skeptics see a story like that, and then they, they assume that after 1,600 years and so many different copies, the entire Bible is so filled with these mistakes that it's completely corrupted and untrustworthy. But that assumption was completely and dramatically changed with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. These are ancient scrolls that have been sort of miraculously preserved in a cave in ancient Israel, including parts of every Old Testament book we have in our Bible except the book of Esther. Jeffrey Scheller, who was formerly the religion editor for the U.S. News and World Report, called it the greatest archaeological discovery of the modern world, the Dead Sea Scrolls. For example, the scroll of Isaiah that was discovered contains all 66 books of the book of Isaiah, all 1,500 verses, and only 13 minor variations were found between that, which was 2,500 years old, and what we have today in our modern Bible. So less than one half of 1%. Remember, Shakespeare was 5% over 200 years. Which means when we read things like, he was wounded for our transgressions, we can have great confidence that what we are reading is exactly what the prophet wrote thousands of years ago. Simply put, when it comes to documentary evidence, the Bible, and especially the New Testament, is either among the most reliable or the most reliable book of the ancient world. So let's move on from literary evidence to what I call collateral evidence, or maybe you would call it historical evidence. Let's go back to George Washington for a second. Let's say that I wanted to start a movement to remove his portrait from the $1 bill. And I wanted to do that because I don't believe he actually existed. I believe George Washington was a created figure, a mythological figure, a legend created by the early patriots to inspire the revolution. 
that's my, that's my movement I'm going to try to start. Are you with me? Well, you wouldn't be because it wouldn't be that hard to, for historians to produce all kinds of collateral evidence for the existence of his life, for the truth of his life. Things he wrote, they'd produce manuscripts, things people wrote about George Washington, portraits painted of him uh, during his lifetime. Uh, you could actually exhume his remains, a little gruesome, but you could do that and test his DNA. Or you could just go study his teeth. His teeth are actually in a museum in Mount Vernon. Yeah, he had some problems there. In other words, you could point to collateral evidence from history and archaeology to demonstrate that George Washington actually lived. Take a look at this passage from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. Let me read it for you. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's an extraordinary three verses. In three verses, Luke includes over a dozen historical details that are not actually necessary for the, for the storyline of the gospel, but yet he includes them almost as if he knows that someday people are going to check it out. Someday people are going to check out what he wrote down to see if he's telling the truth. Let's just pick three of the names he mentions in this paragraph. Pontius Pilate. In 1961, a first century inscription was found carved into limestone that confirmed a man named Pilate had been uh, the Roman prefect at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. It's called the Pilate Stone, and it's actually in a museum in Jerusalem today. You can go look at it. Let's take the name Caiaphas. In 1990, workers were building a water park near Jerusalem, and they discovered a hidden ancient burial chamber in which they found a limestone ossuary, which was like a, a, a bone box that bore the inscription, Joseph, son of Caiaphas, almost certainly the man who arrested Jesus of Nazareth for blasphemy. And then let's take this guy named Lysanias. Interesting name. But for decades, many secular scholars believed that Luke had made a critical mistake here in his historical account because they had evidence, archaeologically, that a guy named Lysanias had lived but that his role was ruler of Chalcis and that he had died in 36 B.C., like 50 years before the time Luke is writing about. So they say, aha, Luke made a mistake. The Bible is not reliable. But then... Years later, another stone inscription was found that read Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. It was dated to 14 to 27 A.D., exactly the time Luke was writing. Lo and behold, there were two ancient men named Lysanias. Who knew? Evidently, Luke knew. In his gospel, Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands. Doesn't make a single known mistake in his history. Or we can look at non-biblical Literature, evidence from non-biblical sources. For example, Jewish historian Josephus, who was most definitely not a Christian, wrote in the late first century and said, at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous, and many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Or Roman historian Tacitus, writing in the early 2nd century, about 80 years or so after Jesus' death and resurrection. He was commenting on the great fire of Rome that happened in 64 AD. He writes, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. On top of that, did you know that if every Bible on earth was destroyed, and if every fragment or complete manuscript of the New Testament was lost to history, the entire New Testament could, re could be reconstructed word for word from the letters that ancient Christians wrote to each other that are still on record. The collateral evidence from history and archaeology tells us the Bible is reliable. Now, none of this necessarily tells us the Bible is from God. It doesn't. It just tells us the Bible is reliable 
as a document. Now we have to move on to thirdly, what I'm calling experiential evidence. Experiential evidence. A number of years ago, um, some of you may have even been there that night. I was on a Sunday night. We had a guest uh, come and speak to us. His name was Dr. Edward Muhima from Uganda. At the time, Dr. Muhima was the director of African Enterprise Ministries in Africa. And I'll never forget uh, how he began his talk that night. He began by saying, I am the 22nd of 43 children born to my father and his seven wives. The whole room went, what? I mean, you don't hear that every day. Dr. Muhima went on to tell a story of how he became a believer, uh, had been sent to a private school, heard uh, the gospel, and eventually became a pastor, and eventually became a double PhD, and uh, I don't know where he works today. But he told a story that night of years ago walking through um, a squalid slum area of of a large African city when he was approached by a man who was begging for money. And Dr. Muhima said he didn't have any money on him he could give the man at that time, so he offered to give him what he did have, which was a copy of the Bible. And the man took it but was, but was angry. Uh, uh, and he said to him, sort of, sort of sarcastically, I will take your Bible and I will use its pages to roll my cigarettes, he said. And he walked away with Dr. Muhima's Bible. Some ten years go by, and Dr. Muhima is preaching um, in a different city, different African city, open-air meeting. He's preaching. In the middle of his sermon, a man stands up from the center in front of him and says, Dr. Muhima, do you recognize me? And he interrupted the sermon. He says, "Uh, no. And the man says, 10 years ago, I asked you for money, and you did not give me any money, but you gave me your Bible. And he said, I was angry, and I told you I would use his pages to roll my cigarettes, and I did, he said. I smoked my way through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He said, and when I got to John, I stopped and I read one page, the third chapter and the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And today, Dr. Mahima, I am a Christian and I came here to thank you, he said. That man discovered that the Bible was more than reliable. The Bible told him the truth, the truth about himself. In Hebrews we read, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Bible is reliable, not just because of the literary evidence and the archaeological evidence, but because it accurately describes what I would call the human condition or the human experience. The Bible tells us that human beings are created in the image of God, and therefore we are absolutely equal and eternal in our value in the eyes of God. And by the way, this Judeo-Christian teaching of the image of God was absolutely unique in the ancient world and is unique among world religions. And if taken seriously, this one teaching, not even getting to Jesus, But image of God speaks to so many of the issues that plague our world and our culture today. Just think about it. The Bible also tells us we were created for relationships with each other and with our Creator, but that relationship has been broken. Our relationships have been marred, the Bible says, by something called sin, which is simply rejecting God's authority and choosing our own way instead. Listen to all the Apostle Paul describes this reality, Romans chapter 7. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, It is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So the Bible explains what is wrong with the world and then explains more personally what's wrong in me. I've told this story before, but when our boys were very little, um, they loved chocolate milk. And so much so that we had to establish the chocolate milk limit law. That was one glass of chocolate milk per boy per day. And one morning I was 
early morning, I was down in my office, and one of our boys came trooping in. He was about four years old. Uh, kind of burst into my office and said, Daddy, could I have some chocolate milk? And I could, looked at him, and I could see the little chocolate milk mustache. <laughs> he had already made himself some. Daddy, can I have some chocolate milk? He said, I said, uh, have you already had your glass of chocolate milk? No. We had to have a little talk that day. Well, the Bible explains that little story. It does. The Bible explains both human goodness and human depravity. It explains why we are capable of extraordinary acts of kindness and love as well as despicable acts of hatred and violence. It tells us about who we are and why we are the way we are. But the Bible also offers hope. Paul finishes that passage in Romans 7 when he, by saying, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. A Christian speaker and author, Ravi Zacharias, who you've probably heard of, uh, tells the story of a Vietnamese man named Hien Pham. Um, the story comes from the Vietnam War era, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, Mr. Pham was a young Christian. In fact, he was just a teenager at the time. But he had the ability to speak English, and somehow um, leaders of the American forces befriended him. He became a valuable resource in translation uh, for the American troops. But when Vietnam eventually fell to the communists, he was arrested and accused um, of being a spy for the Americans. So he was sentenced to re-indoctrination and was sent to a prison camp. Uh, for over a year, he was subjected to both uh, physical and psychological abuse, you might call it torture, uh, nonstop communist propaganda, and eventually this young man began to doubt his faith, his faith in God, his faith in Christ, his trust in everything he had been taught. He began to wonder if the God of the Bible was just a fantasy like they were telling him and not real, maybe God did not exist at all. So he decided in his mind, that he would stop praying to God, that he would abandon his faith. And the very next morning, after he made that decision, he was forced by the prison guards to clean the prison latrines. A horrible job. And while he was emptying one of the cans of waste, a soiled piece of paper with English words printed on it got his attention. So he found a way to wash off the piece of paper and discovered it was a page torn from an English New Testament. And he read, read the words on it. They were from Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And then I am convinced that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he realized in that moment that God had not forgotten him. That God was actually speaking to him through words from the New Testament. And so the next day, Mr. Fahm asked the commander if he could please clean the latrines again. And of course, he was allowed to because nobody wanted to do that job. And he soon discovered that one of the prison guards was evidently using the pages of an English Bible as his toilet paper. So day after day, he did this job, and he slowly cleaned off all the pages and started piecing together his own New Testament. And he said those words from that book, taken from a disgusting latrine enabled him to survive the prison experience until he was released. He eventually came to America, where he lives even today. But to this day, Hien Pham bears witness through his experience that the Bible is not only reliable, but it's alive, and it's active, and it's the very word of God. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, today we thank you for your word. The book that's been delivered to us through the centuries, and we believe by your spirit. So we thank you for these ancient words in which we can know the truth. The truth about you, and in which we can see the truth also about ourselves. We thank you for the hope that we have through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.